through these items that are holy. And the same is in regards to a tzaddik, that Hashem's presence manifests through a tzaddik. And therefore, our respect and our love for the tzaddik is an expression of our expressing love in Hashem for Hashem. When we have faith in a tzaddik, in Pirkei Abbas, it uses the phrase emunas tzaddikim, to have faith in the tzaddik and trust the tzaddik. That faith is also, we say it in Dabini, by Aminu Bashem, and they believed in Hashem, and they believed in Moshe, his servant. So what did we learn the other day? That the belief and faith in Moshe is an expression of our belief and faith in Hashem. And the love that the Yidden had for Moshe, or any uh, chassid has for his rabbi, or any student has for a tzaddik, is an expression of our love for Hashem, because that's the ultimate reason that tzaddik is someone that manifests Hashem's presence. And then we gave the example of the Beis HaMikdash, that just like the Beis HaMikdash, is not only a place that we respect and we're awed by the Beis HaMikdash, but our life is very involved with the Beis HaMikdash, and we're passionate about the Beis HaMikdash. We go there many times a year. We spend hundreds and hundreds of hours a year traveling to and from the Beis HaMikdash. And now we're constantly in our prayers mentioning we want the Beis HaMikdash to be rebuilt. In so many different places, we say it over and over in the same day. The reason for that is because that's where Hashem's presence is revealed more than any other place in the world. And by connecting to that place, that's how we connect to Hashem in a revealed way. And the same is with the tzaddik. That all the time that's spent, Hasidim traveled to the Rebbe for Yontif, and for a long time they're away from home. The traveling itself is something which takes away a lot of time. But by going to the Rebbe, this brings within them a heightened awareness and consciousness of godliness of Hashem's presence. And as a result of that, when they get back home to do what they need to do as Yidin, davening and learning mitzvahs and uh, refined character traits, it's all permeated with a much higher and more refined consciousness of Hashem than it would have been without it. And that's why the tzaddik is compared to the Beis HaMikdash. Now, just like when we talk about Beis HaMikdash, it's not just a holy place. It's the holiest place in the world, which means the Gemara says there are actually 10 levels of holiness and goes on to explain that the land of Israel is holier than any other land in the country, in the world, any other, any other piece of land in the world. In Israel itself, Yerushalayim is a city which is holier than all the other cities. In fact, even in terms of halacha, there's halacha's ramifications to this holiness, which means there are certain halachas that apply only to Eretz Yisrael. And in Eretz Yisrael, there are halachas that apply only to Yerushalayim. And in Yerushalayim, the Har Habayis, which means the mountain where the Beis HaMikdash stands, has more holiness than the rest of Yerushalayim. And on the mountain itself, that spot where the Beis HaMikdash is standing has more holiness than the entire mountain. Then in the Beis HaMikdash itself, there are many compartments. And this goes on. The Gemara says there are nine levels. And the Kodesh HaKadoshim is the highest level, which means there are many levels in how Hashem is revealed. And therefore, all these places are considered holy. But then the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies, that means this is the place in the world where Hashem's presence is revealed in the highest possible way, more than any other place in the world, even more than other holy places in the world. And the same is with tzaddikim. There are many levels in Torah scholars, in tzaddikim, and the same is with tzaddikim that there are many tzaddikim in a generation. Let's say Moshe Rabbeinu's generation, there were many righteous people. They were those who were the leaders of each tribe, so they were righteous people. But Moshe was the leader of all the leaders. So in every generation, there's someone who was equivalent to the Beis Amigdash and equivalent to the Kodesh HaKadosh and the Holy of Holies. And where do we see this? Again, looking in a place which is not 
some hidden Kabbalistic secret, but in some place which is accessible to all of us. So one of the places is Rashi and Chumash. In the booklet, it's page 24. And those who don't have the booklets, it's in Chumash Dvarim, Parshas Ekev, chapter Yud, chapter 10, Pasuk 7. And if we look in the Rashi, in that Pasuk, Rashi raises the question that Moshe Rabbeinu speaks about the breaking of the Luchas. He's rebuking the Yidin about the breaking of the Luchas. And he speaks about that together with speaking about the passing of Aaron Akayin. And these are Rashi's words. I think what came up on the screen is actually Gemara, which we did yesterday. I'm talking about Rashi and Chumash. Right, that's, uh, well, that's the same thing as the Gemara, that whoever attaches himself to Talmud Chacham, like attaching to the Shekhinah. Let's go to the next page. I guess my numbers are from an old edition. This is the one. Let me read it in the English. Moshe put together and reprimanded the Yidden about the shattering of the Luchas, which is because they sinned. And he put it next to the passing of Aaron to teach that the death of the righteous is similar and is by Hashem like the day that the Luchas were broken. So basically, we see that the Torah is drawing a parallel between the breaking of the Luchas and the passing of a tzaddik. That means a tzaddik like Aaron, which was one of the greatest tzaddikim of that generation, his, he was a compared to not just the Beis Amigdash, but as, as like the Luchas, which is in the Holy of Holies of Beis Amigdash. Another source for this, one more source. I guess if that was page 25, then this should be page 26. I think we only have this in Hebrew. Is a Medrash Shir Hashirim. And the Medrash tells a story that there was someone who was called Rabbi Lezer HaGadol. Right, that's it. Rabbi Lezer HaGadol was considered the greatest leader of Torah in his generation. And in those days, they, to be higher than the rest of the crowd so that everyone could see him, he would sit on a rock and everyone would be standing and sitting around him. One of his students, whose name was Rabbi Yeshua, did the following. We'll read the words in Hebrew. Pamachas, Nichnas Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yeshua, who was one of his disciples, entered the yeshiva, walked over to this rock, and Hizchil Menashek Oiso Heaven. He was kissing the rock. V'Oman, he said, Heaven Hazayis, this rock, I would compare it to me. I look at it like Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. And the one who sat on this rock, he would be like the Oran and the Luchas, which is the source of the entire Torah. In other words, being that Rabbi Lezer HaGadol, he was the source of Torah for that generation. So just like the Torah, the source of the entire Torah is in the Luchas, the two tablets. And that was given on Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. So therefore, he, Rabbi Yeshua said that Rebbe Lezer is like the Luchas and the mountain, the rock rather, is like Har Sinai. So again, we see the wrong of the parallel between the holiest article in the world, which are the Luchas. That's where Hashem's presence is revealed more than any other place in the world. And that's why the Holy of Holies is a place that no one was allowed to enter. And even the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, can only enter once a year on Yom Kippur. And even on Yom Kippur, there was a limited amount of time that he was allowed to go in. So with this, we complete the second part. And now we're gonna go to page 29, part three. On top of the page, it says the davening and brachas of the tzaddik. So one of the things which is characteristic of all Hasidic groups is that Hasidim 
turn to the Rebbe to daven for them, or turn to the Rebbe to give them a bracha, a blessing for something that they need. And this is also one of those things that there was a lot of controversy surrounding this approach. And if you want to daven, you daven to Hashem yourself directly. You need a bracha, you ask Hashem to give you a bracha. Why do we need to go to a human being and ask him to daven for me? Why do I need to go to a human being, no matter how great he is, and ask him to give me a bracha? Every one of us has a direct line with Hashem himself. Why do we need to involve another person? And there are those who will even add, isn't involving someone in the middle is like, God forbid, creating an intermediate between us and Hashem, and that goes against the 13 principles of belief. So first of all, following the same pattern, we need to establish the source. Where is the source in Torah that it's a positive thing and it's appropriate to ask the tzaddik to daven for me and to get the bracha? Before I even go there, I just want to uh, make, say something that there should be no misunderstanding. No one davens to a tzaddik. No such thing. Davening, which means to pray, you pray only to Hashem Himself. When we talk about asking the tzaddik to daven for me, I'm asking the tzaddik to daven for me. But it's not instead of me davening. Let me emphasize again, every single one of us has a mitzvah, a commandment, that if there's anything in the world that you need, physically or spiritually, anything, it's a mitzvah to turn to the source of everything, which is Hashem, and ask Him for it. That's the mitzvah. I think I mentioned earlier when we spoke about prayer, that there are questions whether the text of the prayer is, is an obligation three times a day is an obligation. But one thing is an obligation according to all opinions. That is anything that any of us need, then it's a mitzvah to turn to Hashem and ask him for it. So how could we go to the tzaddik instead? So the answer is, and this with the misconception, we're not going to the tzaddik instead of doing it myself. We go to the tzaddik in addition to me myself turning to Hashem. So every one of us, just like you look at a chassid, one of the things chassidim were known for more than anything else was the time and energy that they invested in davening, remember? So of course a chassid davens to Hashem. Not only davens, but spends hours davening to Hashem and pouring out his heart to Hashem. In addition to the chassid davening himself, he also turns to the Rebbe that the Rebbe should daven for me. So let's look at the sources. We can go to the next page. That's the first source. It's a Gemara. And the Gemara says like this, Darash Reb Pinchos Bar Chama. Reb Pinchos Bar Chama taught the following. Whoever has a sick person in his house, someone at home in the family is not well, what should he do? He should go to a sage and have the sage plead for mercy on his behalf. So there could be no doubt that this is not something which is contrary to Torah. It's actually the instructions of the Torah itself. This is Gemara. And the Gemara bases it on a verse, on a Pusik, where it says, Hamas melech malachem maves, the ish chacham When there's a king's fury, it means the anger, Hashem is angry, and God forbid he sends the messenger of opposite of life, a wise man, meaning a tzaddik, will wipe it away. So we go to the tzaddik to wipe it away. That's one source. I have a question. Yes. You said you like questions. Yes. Um, <laughs> Not too difficult. One, only those that I can answer. Okay. So today sure. we go to the Ohel, or is it also advised that we maybe go to B'nai Barak or some other tzaddik in the world, or just the Ohel? I understand the question. You said that if a sick, if a sick person uh, needs a blessing from a sadiq, we should go to him. But we don't have the rebbe; we have the ohel. But there are other people 
that say that I've heard that there are other Siddiquim. But the reason why we go to the Ohel, yes, it's part of our lesson. We're gonna, it's actually, I think it's in this part, but if not, we will definitely be covering it. That when we go to the Ohel of a Tzaddik, we're not just going to the Ohel, we're going and we're asking the Tzaddik, just like during his lifetime, we asked him to pray for us. So we know from the Torah that even after that, we can also turn to the tzaddik, go to the place of his burial, and we ask him for what we ask for, and he prays for us just as well. And we'll go into the sources later, but one of the famous sources are that in the story of the 12 tribes, one of the, only two of the leaders didn't fail in their mission. And that is Yeshua and Kaleb ben Yefuna, the leader of the tribe of Yehuda. Ten of the leaders of all the tribes unfortunately failed in their mission. And as a result of that, the Jews had to stay in the desert for another 40 years. So what was it, as the Gemara says, and we'll, we'll cover this inside, what was it that gave him the strength to be able to rise above the rest and not fail? And the Gemara says because he snuck away from the group and he went to Hebron, to the burial place of Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Baleah, and he turned to them and he prayed to them, not prayed to them, he requested of them that they should pray for him, that he should not be caught up in plans that are inappropriate, that deviate from his mission, and as a result of that, he was protected. So the Gemara says, the words he used was, Avaisai, my fathers, please pray for me that I should not get caught up in the schemes of the other spies. So that and other sources in Torah, which we'll cover, show us that when we go to the oil, we are going to a tzaddik. And we're, what we're saying is that at this point, the tzaddik will pray for us no different than he prayed for us before. Another source for this is page 33, I think. If you can move the notes, keep going. Let's keep going. This page. This is a Ramban. Ramban is one of the most famous commentators on the Torah. And it's on the Parsha Yisro. Yisro, thank you. Now it's set up right. Yisro was the father in law of Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe Rabbeinu had people standing online to talk to him, tens, thousands of people. And Yisro came to Moshe and said that this is too much. People are standing online for hours and it's going to drain them. So when he spoke to Moshe and he said to him that this is draining for all these people. So Moshe answered him these words where you see the arrow. This is the Hebrew and we can read from the English. Moshe said to them, Moshe said, and these people are standing online to talk to me because of the many things that they need. They come to me that I should pray for those that are sick. And I should also let them know how they can find things that they've lost. And he goes on to prove how that is. In other words, the story in Chumash, we have a whole Pasha, which is called Yisro, which is about people standing online for hours to be able to speak to Moshe, what were they waiting for? One of the things was to ask him to pray for those that were sick. So clearly, this is not something which is a, a Hasidic original idea that came from the Baal Shem Tov. This is clearly in the Torah that it's a positive thing to go to a tzaddik and ask him to pray for us. Another source, page 34. This is in Chumash Bamidbar, Parsha Bahaloischa. And it's chapter 11, Pasuk 2. In this part of the Chumash, there was a plague that broke out. And unfortunately, people were dying. Right? We're on the right page now. And it says in the, in the Pasuk Beis, in, in the verse number 2, the people cried out to Moshe. You know, whenever there's a commentary, comment from Rashi, there must be a question. And the question is, why did they cry out to Moshe? It should have said, they cried out to Hashem. So let's look at what Rashi says. So this is not only a source 
that it's a positive thing to ask the tzaddik to pray for me, but Rashi also gives a reason. This is compared to a, I'm reading Rashi, a mortal king, king of flesh and blood, who was angry with his son. What did the son do? He went to his father's intimate friend. This is someone whose father loves very dearly. And he said to him, go ask forgiveness for me, for my, for my father. In other words, you go to my father because he loves you and he'll listen to what you say. And you can ask him for me that he should forgive me. In the same way, Hashem, who's the king, was upset with his child, with his son, which is the Jewish people, who are called the children of Hashem. And we went to Moshe, which is Hashem's so-called, metaphorically speaking, intimate friend. And we know that Hashem loves Moshe so much. Please, Moshe, go to Hashem and ask Hashem for forgiveness on our behalf. So in other words, here Rashi gives an explanation. Of course, we all have a direct line with Hashem. And of course, we're all expected to turn to Hashem. But Hashem will also look at our, at our record, at the positive things, at the negative things. Do I deserve it? Do I not deserve it? So when a tzaddik comes to Hashem, someone that Hashem loves because all his actions and his life is a life that's dedicated to Hashem and he's completely loyal, this is a person that when he makes a request, Hashem hears it uh, in a way more and, and, and uh, less conditioned, so to speak, than an ordinary person asks. I think I mentioned this in the, in the school earlier in the year, maybe not everyone is in class, but from all the years that I've taught this class, one time someone asked me a question. And I thought that was an interesting question because I never heard it before, never heard it after. So I bring it up every year. And the question was, well, you're saying that I'm praying and Hashem is not answering me. So I go to Moshe and say, you pray for me. The girl said, it sounds a little bit underhanded. It's like you go to your father for money and he says, no. Then you go to your mother and say, mom, could you do me a favor and get this money out of dad? I need the money. It's like going behind his back? That's a good question. But I use the same analogy and I said to her, but what if your father says to you, I'm not giving you the money. The only way I'll give you the money is if you turn to your mother and you tell her to ask me. Would that be considered underhanded if you go to your mother? Absolutely not. That's what his wishes. It's the same here. Who is the source that tells us that the proper thing to do is to go to a tzaddik and ask him to pray for us, it's from the Torah, it's from Hashem. So that means I'm turning to Hashem and he's not answering me the way I would like. So Hashem is telling me, if you want, when we read the Gemara, when we read the Rashi and Chumash, when we read something in the Torah, that's Hashem speaking to us and telling us that when you're not able to accomplish that because obviously there's something blocking, go to a tzaddik and he'll be able to overcome that and he'll be able to get your prayer, your request answered. So I have a question. Yeah. In that regard, would the tzaddik know like um, whether or not to, to actually dive into Hashem for what you asked? Like, obviously he wants to, he wants like, then maybe not in the terms of like healing, but if someone is, you know, can you pray to Hashem for X, Y, and Z? Would the tzaddik know like your intentions on asking? Do you understand what I'm trying to ask? Uh, you're asking if I understand what you're asking. Like when you said like, like um, if, you, if you go to your mother, then it's like backhanded. But if your father said, go to your mom and ask, but so I'm saying would the, I, I don't know, maybe I'm Would not the rabbi be aware that. of that? The yeah. Is, absolutely, because the basis for Hasidim doing this is everything that's written in Torah about the, uh, the advantage of going to a tzaddik, that a tzaddik is very close to Hashem, and he can bring my request to Hashem in a way that's more than what I could. I mean, there's more to it, but, but this would be the, like, if it's Rashi and Chumash, it means it's not deep Kabbalah, it's very simple, it's very basic, and I'm starting with that. And later we'll be able to go even deeper how it is that me with my turning to the tzaddik is really in a sense trusting Hashem, but I'm asking the tzaddik to bring me and present me before Hashem 
present my request before Hashem. And I'm sorry I didn't remember, but here we are with the second question about going to the Ohel of a Tzadik. So if you look here, this is, next page is the Shulchan Aruch. And it's the laws of how we are supposed to conduct ourselves the day before Rosh Hashanah. And it's um, paragraph 13. You have it in Hebrew and in English. So I'll read the English. After the morning prayers on the day before Rosh Hashanah, naturally it's the beginning of the year. This is the time we pray that Hashem should um, inscribe us and Hashem should seal us, seal the year that it should be a good year. So of course, it's, it's totally focused on prayer, but it's customary to go to the cemetery and prostrate upon the graves of saintly saint men, meaning to lay down and charity is distributed amongst the poor. Supplications are made. And he says here two things. To exhort the saintly men to intercede for us on the day of judgment. Also for the further reason that the place where saintly men is, rest is holy and pure. And prayers are more readily acceptable when offered on holy ground. So when I'm standing at the Ohel or the gravesite of any tzaddik. Number one, my personal prayers are more readily expect, accepted because I'm standing in a holy place. Like when you daven in a shul, it'll have more power than davening at home. When you daven in the base Hamigdash, it'll have more power than davening in an ordinary shul. So when you daven in the presence of a tzaddik, it, because it's a holy place, my prayer will also be more accepted. The other reason is we're actually asking the tzaddik to intercede on our behalf and be like uh, the one who's going to bring my prayers to Hashem. And because he's a tzaddik, he'll be able to uh, hopefully overcome anything that's blocking and standing in the way, and then my prayer should be accepted. And the next page is the Gemara that I mentioned before, so now we can read it inside. And this is the story with Kalev, that he was the one this is Gemara you're looking at, that it says in the Chumash, and they ascended to the south, and he arrived at Hebron. So the Gemara asks, it should say, they arrived at Hebron. Hebron is in the south of Israel. So the Gemara says, no, this teaches us that singular form that this person, Kale, he actually separated himself from the plans of the spies, and he went to Hebron, prostrated himself at the graves of the patriarchs, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And he turned to them and he said, Avoisa, my fathers, ask for mercy for me, that I should be saved from the entanglement in the designs, meaning the scheming of the spies. So the verse speaks in singular because Kalev alone arrived at Hebron. And we see that, yes, the other 10 spies actually failed and Kalev, in, in, in because he had the blessing and he had the uh, others, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov pray for him, he was able to have the strength to overcome the test. I just want to add one more thing. Which I don't think we have it here, but we talk about this a lot in school when the time comes to go to the Ohel. That is another story, which is also found in Chumash, and that is that Yosef requested, I mean, Yaakov requested that they should, um, they should be buried in Mara Samach Pela in Hebron together with Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Sarah, and Rivka, and Leah in that holy place. And then Yaakov, this is in the Chumash in the Pasha Vayichi. Then Yaakov turns to Yosef and says, I know you have it you probably have bad feelings about the fact that I didn't bury your mother in that place, Rachel. Rachel was buried somewhere on the road. As we know now, it's called Beis Lechem. But you should know that what I did was by Hashem's instructions. It wasn't, God forbid, that I was uh, not late. I was lazy to do it. I wasn't motivated to do it. It was something that was difficult because of the weather. This was Hashem's instructions. And why did Hashem tell me to do that? Because Hashem saw the future, the Jewish people will be going to exile. This is referring to the Babylonian exile. 
And on the way to the exile, they'll be passing by this spot. So Hashem prearranged that Rachel should be buried there. So when the Jewish people will pass that spot in their condition of such, of such agony and suffering as slaves and being taken away in chains, she will come out of her grave and she will pray for them that Hashem should have compassion on them and save them and so on. So in other words, Rochel for thousands of years is not buried together with all the tzaddikim, with her own husband, Yaakov, and not with Leah, her sister, and not with Avram, Yitzhak, and the others. Why? So that the Jews will be able to turn to her, that she should pray for them when they'll be in exile. So we see from this how powerful it must be that when you turn to a tzaddik or a tzaddikus, a woman who's a tzaddik, to turn to Hashem and pray for me. But again, clearly that there's no question whether this is something that's permissible and not only permissible, but something which is advisable. The next part of the booklet, I'm not going to read any of the pages. I am left it here for you to read. It's a story. It's a, it's a long story, but it's about a woman who got the blessing of a, of a Navi, of a prophet. His name was Elisha. Gave her a blessing to have a child. And then one day the child was sick and unfortunately he passed away in her arms. And it says she picked up the child that tzaddik, that navi, that prophet had, a, had an apartment in her house, had a room that whenever he traveled, he would stay there. She went up to his apartment, his room, put the child who was not alive on the bed. Then she ran to the navi and she pleaded with him, you promised me a child. And at the end, he came to the house and he brought this child back to life. In other words, obviously there was a decree from Hashem that this child should pass away. But nevertheless, she turned to the tzaddik and the tzaddik is able to override the decree through his prayer. And this tzaddik, this prophet, through his prayer and through his actions, he brought this child back to life. So here we see again how one conducts themselves when they, they look at a situation where it looks like they can't do anything more. But nevertheless, they go to a tzaddik who can do beyond what an ordinary person can do. In fact, there's a quote, which we'll also talk about the next time we do this class, where it says that a tzaddik gezer, a tzaddik gives a decree and Hashem will fulfill the decree. Or something similar, Hashem could make a decree and then a tzaddik could nullify and cancel the decree, which means Hashem empowered the tzaddik that when he makes a decree, the tzaddik, if he'll pray to me, Hashem says, I will cancel the decree. So therefore we turn to the tzaddik, especially when there's, God forbid, a crisis and such a big need. I have a question, Rabbi. Yes, Miriam, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, Rabbi Hashem. And um, my question is, can I ask any rabbi to pray or it needs to be like a tzaddik, like only our rabbi? So I'm sure you're aware that throughout the last few months, everybody was praying for everybody. In other words, there were text messages, please pay for this one. This one is, is, is very, it's urgent, which means any yid, any man or woman could pray for someone else. And sometimes my prayer could help that person more than the person himself for whatever reason. Maybe it's the Abbas Yisrael part that Hashem sees that one Jew cares for another Jew and that gives Hashem so much pleasure that in that merit, Hashem will listen to the prayer. So first of all, any person, you can turn to a friend and ask them, please pray for this and this person or pray for me. Certainly, if I, and not only an ordinary friend, but if someone was a Torah scholar, if someone was a rabbi, someone who is spiritually uh, a, a little bit above and beyond the rest, is also someone who has the power to accomplish things that ordinary people can't accomplish. But then there are levels in tzaddikim, so it's not only the Rebbe. The Rebbe is a tzaddik that's an exceptional tzaddik. But definitely, we can turn to any person that you know and cares 
to turn to them and ask them that in addition to, again, in addition to my prayer, not instead, but in addition, I'm asking you to also pray for me. Got it? Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. I also have okay. a question. Yes. Um, oh gosh, the feedback is really bad. Okay. Um, my hey, question who, is... There's two of you there. I know. <laughs> my question is, um, what, what happened in the past, like, two months when we couldn't go to shul and get the most godliness possible? Where, did we have enough godliness at home when we were praying? Um, or, like, what if someone is not able to go to shul? Is the shrina just as powerful at home than in shul because they're, they're not supposed to go to shul? Like, I always wondered that. Right. Well, generally speaking, if there's a circumstances which, according to Torah, I shouldn't go to shul or the shul is closed. In other words, Hashem himself is sort of telling us not to do that. Then usually, if it's something that I'm doing, doing by the instructions of Torah, then Hashem will sort of compensate and, yeah, bring the Shekhinah to me and bring the Shekhinah to us wherever we are, that we should be able to accomplish what we would have accomplished in the shul. Nevertheless, we still wait for the day that we can go physically back to the shul. It's like with Golas, we have no base on Migdash, so we can't bring sacrifices. But Hashem says, if you study the sacrifices, you recite the sacrifices, I'll consider it as if you're doing it, but we still say we want the real thing, we want the actual base of Migdash, and, and not just as if, but we want the actual thing. So the same would be here. On some level, Hashem compensates, at another level, there's nothing like having the actual uh, factual thing, which is the shul itself and going to the shul itself. Okay, wishing everybody a successful day, whatever's left of it. That's Lacha Rabbah. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi, for okay. the best.